Unfortunately, I've lived through this coding interview. Uh, I guess what we can do is we can create uh, an array and- My grandmother, wrong fossil, then you'll code. Despite the fact that a standard sort.sort .sort is built into basically every coding language aside from brain fuck, and Claude 3.7 can regurgitate any sorting algorithm perfectly, there are still a few great reasons to learn these sorting algorithms. One, to pass technical interviews. Interviewers still ask this stuff. I couldn't really tell you why, but they do. Two, to practice writing hard code. Despite the fact that these algorithms are solved problems, we still need to, you know, like solve hard problems as engineers. And these algorithms are really good practice for just that. And three, to practice algorithmic thinking and to understand big O complexity. Again, even if you won't be writing these algorithms from scratch daily in your job, it's important to understand that when you call sort.sort .sort in your language of choice, it's probably doing something very similar to quicksort and it will take roughly order and log n time. So first, let's start with the tortoise of sorting algorithms, bubble sort. Bubble sort is the sorting algorithm that everyone learns, but no one actually uses in the real world because it's so slow. We learn it because it's easy to understand. And once we appreciate how slow it is, the other sorting algorithms are just that much more impressive. It all starts with an unsorted list of numbers. Then we loop from left to right and compare each pair of neighboring numbers. If the number on the right is smaller than the number on the left, we just swap them. Otherwise, we just leave them be. When we get to the end, we just go back to the start and do it again. We repeat this process over and over and over until we go all the way from left to right without making any swaps. The code for bubble sort is short and simple. It's really easy to understand and write, but it is slow. Clocking in at just order n squared, it frankly doesn't get much worse than this for sorting algorithms. By the way, stick around to the end of this video and I'll play full visualizations of all the sorting algorithms we discuss on even larger data sets. But for now, let's move on to merge sort. First, let me explain the pros and cons of merge sort, and then we'll break down the algorithm step by step. Merge sort is much more efficient than bubble sort, which if you're here slogging through an algorithms course, you probably already know a little bit about. In big O terms, merge sort is order n log n, which makes it a lot faster than bubble sort's shameful order n squared. Now order n log n is about as good as we can do when it comes to sorting unsorted lists. But there are a lot of things that affect performance on a smaller scale that are worth thinking about. For example, merge sort space complexity is less than ideal. It requires copies of the original list to work with, which means it's going to take up more memory than an algorithm that can sort the list in place. It's also slower than some other algorithms like insertion sort when it comes to sorting smaller lists. And that's because of the memory allocation, the copying, and even the overhead of the recursive function calls. All those things have a constant toll on the performance of the algorithm. So they don't really affect the big O, which is order n log n, but they do affect the performance in practice. And that effect is disproportionately bad on smaller lists. Okay, so how does merge sort work? Well, first we start with an unsorted list of numbers. We split the list into two parts, and we keep doing that recursively until each list has at most one item. Next, we start merging each of those lists back together. The process is actually pretty simple. We take two small lists, iterate over each item in both lists at the same time from left to right, and we just compare them, moving the smaller of the two into a newly sorted list. By the time we've moved all the way back up the tree, we'll have a fully sorted single list. It's a recursive divide and conquer algorithm. It uses a pair of recursive calls at each level to split the list into parts, all the way down until we have a single element in each list. Then it merges them all back up the call stack again by looking at each element in both of the lists one at a time. It's an n log n algorithm because it needs to be called recursively log n times. And at each level in the recursive call, all items in the list are compared. So merge sort is fast, order n log n, but the need for recursion and extra arrays in memory does take a bit of a toll. So let's shift gears now and talk about insertion sort. 
First, let me talk about when and why you would actually use Insertion Sort, and then I'll break down the algorithm step by step. Insertion Sort is interesting because it's actually really slow in the average case, order n squared, but it has a niche use case where it's actually used in the real world because of how fast it is. And that's when the data is already mostly sorted and when the data set is very small. Some sorting libraries will actually use insertion sort when the data set is small enough and fall back to a different algorithm on larger sets. So how does it work? Well, it's actually one of the simpler algorithms. We start with an unsorted list of numbers. We'll iterate over each index or each position from left to right. And we're gonna keep track of two indexes, i and j. i will be the index of the current number that we are on. And j will start at that same position but it'll actually move to the left. I'll show you in a second. Now, because it's a look back algorithm, we can actually skip the first index. We'll set i and j equal to position one or index one, which is of course the second position. Now the number doing the swapping will be the number at j and the number at one less than j. i actually has nothing to do with the swapping. It's just kind of keeping our place in the algorithm. So we look at the number at position j at the number at position j minus one. And if they're out of order, we're going to swap them and decrement j. If they're already in order, then we can just move on and increment i. And whenever we increment i, we also move j back up to where i is. It seems really fast at first because i and j are close to the start of the list, so the amount of backtracking j has to do isn't very much. But you'll notice as i and j get larger and larger, we're going to have to look back through more and more of the list. So insertion sort is great for small lists, but what about big ones? What if we have a giant list and we don't want to allocate extra arrays that we'd get with merge sort? Quick sort is a great option here. Quick sort is fast and efficient, and unlike some of the other algorithms, it's actually used in the real world. Looking at you, bubble sort. Quick sort is a divide and conquer algorithm, just like merge sort. And while it technically has the same big O complexity as merge sort, order n log n, it doesn't require so much memory and it doesn't have to copy elements from sublist to sublist. It actually sorts the entire list in place, which means that it can be more performant. All right, let's dive into how it works. We'll start with a random list of numbers. The first thing we need for quicksort is a pivot number and to keep things simple, we'll just arbitrarily use the element at the end of the list. In this case, five. Next, we need two pointers, i and j, to keep track of things as we're gonna be swapping them around. I will start at index negative one, which of course isn't a real index, but we need to be able to increment into index zero on the first swap. Then J will start at index zero, which is eight. So in this case, we'll be comparing eight and five. And because eight is not less than five, meaning J is not less than the pivot, we don't move I, but we do increment J. Now we do it again. We compare J to the pivot, three to five, and because this time j is less than the pivot, we increment i, then we swap i and j. Now I understand that it's a bit funky. We are comparing j and the pivot, but actually swapping i and j. Just, just remember that. All right, and now we just do it again. So now we'll compare j to the pivot again, in this case, two and five. And again, because j is less than the pivot, we increment i, and then we swap i and j. Next, we compare nine and five. Now this time J is greater than the pivot. So no swaps, we move J forward, but we do not move I forward. One is less than five, so we move I up and we swap I and J. Seven is greater than five, so no swaps here. Six is also greater than five, again, no swaps. 10 is greater than five, no swapping. Four is less than five, one last swap. All of the numbers at or to the left of i are smaller than the pivot, and all of the numbers to the right of i are greater than the pivot. If we swap i plus one with the pivot now, then the pivot will be in its perfectly sorted place. Now, that's just one round of the partition function in quicksort, but frankly, it's the interesting part. The way we turn this partition function into a full-blown quicksort is by recursively calling this partition function. So we'll continuously partition, do this algorithm, over and over on each half of the list until the full list is sorted. Now, remember how I mentioned that quicksort is generally more performant than merge sort? That's true, but it does have a dark side. If we consistently pick the smallest or largest element from the list as the pivot, 
it gets really slow and will actually degenerate into order n squared in big O terms, which effectively makes it a bubble sort equivalent, which is something that no sorting algorithm wants to be. But honestly, that shouldn't scare you. There's pretty trivial ways to make sure that quick sort never degrades. For example, we can just check and make sure that the list isn't pre-sorted we could randomize the list before sorting it, or we could even pick the pivot at random for maximum chaos. Anyways, optimized versions of quicksort are used all over the place in the real world. Most languages' standard libraries actually do use quicksort at least uh, for part of the standard implementation of their sorting algorithms. Now, as promised, I programmed animations of all these sorting algorithms on larger data sets so you can better visualize how they work at scale. Take a look. <laughs> 